This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Mises Weekends. As promised, uh, we are joined by Saifedean Amus. Uh, he is, for, for our purposes, most importantly, author of the Bitcoin Standard, the Decentralized Alternative to Central Banking. He's also a professor of economics at the Lebanese American University in Beirut, Lebanon, which is where he makes his home, uh, holds a PhD from Columbia. But today he's visiting his wife's family in Canada, so we're, we're, we're pleased to have him uh, on East Coast time. So, Safe, uh, thanks. Great to finally sort of meet you. Thank you, Jeff. It's it's a huge uh, honor and a pleasure to be uh, on this uh, show with you. Uh, I'm a huge uh, fan of the Mises Institute, and I've spent the last 10 years um, scouring your website and reading everything uh, you guys, well, okay. not everything, there's still a lot, 10 years is not enough to read all the content you guys put out, but uh, I've learned from the Mises Institute more than I've learned from any school in your university, and I will forever be grateful to you guys. Thank wow. you. Wow, well, thank you. Uh, so I got to tell you, uh, you kind of came out of nowhere. You, you for, for for at least from my perspective, this isn't a criticism. You were not a big name in Austrian or crypto circles prior to this book. No, absolutely not. I mean, I um, you know I was doing my PhD at Columbia. It was as you can probably guess, it was like a mainstream economics program. I only started re really learning about Austrian economics towards the end of my uh, time there, and then when I finished uh, having learned Austrian economics. I realized, you know, I need to get, uh, I, I need to be productive. I need to get a real job, and I so I chose to get a job being uh, in in a teaching uh, position in Lebanon because I just, after you know, having been in academia all my life and been in university and then my PhD program, I really wanted to just be productive because I understood that you know there's no way to be happy and fulfilled in your life unless you're actually being of service to other people, and so mm. I focused on a teaching career in Lebanon. And I was learning Austrian economics uh, mostly by just reading things online. I'm definitely uh, one of the uh, many Mises fans around the world. Okay. Well, first, uh, I mean, right from the get-go, the Bitcoin standard, what I love about this is, is you're using that not as a dismissal of, of the old gold standard thinking, but actually as an homage to it. A lot of crypto folks like to imagine we're in a totally new world and, and, and gold is cranky and we shouldn't talk about it. But I, I, I view the title as your nod to gold. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, you know, if you read the book, the first seven chapters of the book, you know, they barely even mention uh, Bitcoin. And uh, it could be a book about the history of money. It could be a book that's written by uh, a hard money gold advocate. And that's essentially where I was up until 2013, 14. Um, and, you know, for me, Bitcoin is just uh, a continuation of the same sound money principles of gold. And that's that that's the point that my book is trying to make. Well, we you know, we, when we look back at Menger, when we look at Mises, you know, the word we hear over and over is emerging. Things emerge. So in yeah. that sense, this is emerging in the digital age. It, it, it would be it would be odd if money didn't take on a digital uh, element today. In other words, Bitcoin is almost to be expected or, in, or predictable in that sense. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how much that is colored by the hindsight bias. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that once you understand it, you think, wow, this is so obvious and it should have been there. But, you know, for many years before that, um, a f only a few people have been trying to build something like this, you know, very small community of cypherpunks on mailing lists. Um, very few people had really thought that something like that would be possible. The, um, you know, the precursors were things like e-gold, you know, the idea of having gold, um, having digital payments backed by physical gold that is stored somewhere. But the, the, the problem with that was the fact that, you know, needing to put the gold somewhere means that the government can come and shut it down in order to enforce their monopoly. Right. And Bitcoin really can be best understood as a workaround around that. You know, this is really the main advantage that Bitcoin has that it's just built so that it doesn't have a, an address that the FBI can come and knock down and uh, um, prevent it from continuing to operate. Well, we'll get to some of the, the questions about Bitcoin, some of the features about Bitcoin. Uh, I guess we should get started. You know, why don't you just give us your, your basic case for why Austrians should be interested in Bitcoin, why they should support it, promote it, and, and also the devil's advocate uh, position that I'm sure you hear critiques of Bitcoin from from gold bugs and from Austrians. Uh, 
Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, let me say that, you know, I heard about Bitcoin about maybe 2009, 2010, pretty early on, and I was quite skeptical of it working out. Up until 2013, 14 is when I started really thinking, okay, this thing uh, is, is worth paying attention to. And so I completely mm -hmm. sympathize and understand with Austrian economists who dismiss it. And, you know, if you study the history of money, you see that the history of money has been for the past thousands of years, lots of cranks coming up and saying, you know, we have this new thing that's better than gold. And it always never works out, you know, John Maynard Keynes being only the latest in that long line of cranks. So I completely understand and sympathize with the skepticism of uh, Austrian economists towards Bitcoin. And I think it's, it's a healthy thing to have. But, you know, after a while, it's, it's, it's worth paying attention to it. And I think the reason, you know, the reason that Austrian economists, I think, should, should really pay attention to it is that the you know the main criticism they might get or some of the main criticisms that well it's not physical it doesn't mm -hmm. exist and you don't hold it there but you know uh, just because something is not physical doesn't mean it can't have value value as Austrians should know you know it's a subjective thing it exists only in our mind so a lot of things that are not physical have value you know the data on your computer has value if I you know if I took your laptop and told you I'll return it to you in the exact same exact physical condition but I'm just going to press a few keys that will remove some non-physical things from it, that would, you know, you'd probably pay me money for me to not do that. You know, it's worth something, right. the data, your pictures, um, you know, your reputation, your uh, business brand name, all of these things are not physical things, but they're also, but but they're worth that, they are valued. And, you know, that, that's a perfectly normal thing. So just because it's not physical doesn't mean it doesn't have value. <laughs> And the second point, and I think the most important one, is that it won this valuation on the free market. It won this valuation not through the point of a gun. Nobody forced anybody to say, you know, this is this has to be valued at that. This is why it can't be fiat money. It's not fiat because, you know, fiat means somebody's decision, somebody's order. Somebody put a gun to somebody's head and told them you have to accept this at that value. But Bitcoin is not like that. It's it's the most astonishing thing about Bitcoin is that it emerged, is that it got this value out of nowhere, you know. It isn't, it isn't backed by anything, it isn't redeemable by anything, and yet people pay money for it, and people have exchanged it for billions and billions of dollars over the last nine or almost ten years over time. So that's a market value that has emerged on its own. And, you know, if you read uh, Austrian economists from Menger to Mises to Rothbard to Salerno, you know, Salerno's recent book, Money Sound and Unsound, uh, I quote it in my book and you can find many quotes, you know, all of them, they understand that gold is money, but you know, it's not, it, it's not this crude uh, fetishism of gold of, you know, because it's yellow and shiny or because it's, uh, it, it, it has to be gold, um, that it has to be money. It's, uh, it's an understanding of the fact that if left to the free market, gold emerges as money, gold is valued and chosen as a store of value because you know, the, the, the physical properties that it has help it to gain that. But the reason that it is money is not any one particular physical property. It's the fact that that is what emerges out of people's decisions. And so, you know, the, the, the Austrians understand that gold is, should be money, but fundamentally they're not wedded to the idea of gold or silver as money. They're wedded to the idea of a free market choice in money. And that's the definition of sound money. It's money whose value and acceptability is emergent on the market people accept it at a value that they choose not a th not a value imposed by third parties so for me this is this is really why um, bitcoin matters because it fulfills these criteria for being sound money it is hard money in that its supply can't be increased and that's i think is the most interesting aspect of it and it's 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 even harder than gold in that regard because gold you can always dig deeper and find more but bitcoin you'll never get more than 21 million and this hardness just like in the case of gold, is what go, what 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 gives it that um, ability to play the role of money, and so this is why I think it's 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 very interesting and worth looking at. Um, where it is where it has an advantage over gold is really, and then that's the reason that why Bitcoin was invented. And if we were still on a gold standard, I'm 100% certain we would not have had Bitcoin invented. There would be no motivation for it. The difference that it has on, between gold, you know, is not in um, it, 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 it's uh, obviously the physical characteristics of gold are maybe an advantage that it can be held or so on. But the other advantage that, that it's not physical means that it its clearance all over the world doesn't have to be centralized. It's far more decentralized as a settlement and uh, clearance uh, layer. And so 
it being decentralized makes it much harder to confiscate, much harder to co-opt. You know, if you think about how gold's monetary role was uh, w- w- was restricted, it happened through governments taking over central banks. And central banks, you know, to a large extent, they were there was a real market demand for central banking with gold because moving physical gold around with every transaction is not very convenient. But using settlement of physical gold has enormous economies of scale when banks are able to settle payments with one another. So that led to the centralization of gold reserves around more and more centralized banks till we got to the point where effectively we only have one central bank in the world today, the US central bank, which holds an enormous amount of gold. Bitcoin effectively by making the final layer of settlement, the final layer of clearance of payments much more decentralized and much cheaper than uh, gold, will instead of us having a few central banks at the top, Bitcoin would have hundreds or thousands or maybe tens of thousands of entities that can function as central banks, that can function as a final layer of settlement. And thus it becomes a much more difficult entity for governments to control. So I think, you know, if you value sound money, if you value the ability of market uh, to, uh, if you want the market, if you want money that emerges on the market, you should probably be interested in this. I'm not saying this is a pitch for people to invest in it. I don't, I'm, I, I, don't uh, I, I don't particularly care if people invest or not. And I don't think, you know, Bitcoin, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to sell people on Bitcoin. I think it's if it's going to win, it's going to continue to succeed because of its economic properties and not because I'm going on uh, on TV and on the Internet and telling people to buy it. So. I think it's just the economic reality of it that uh, w- w- will likely enforce itself if it is worthwhile or not. Should we care about the regression theorem or, or circularity when it comes to Bitcoin? Do you care about those things? Um, yes. I mean, I think, first of all, you know, there's always a problem with applying old theories to new things because, you know, this is a category that didn't exist before. But I think, you know, the value of the regression theorem is in illustrating how money emerges from a barter system without the need of government. So the point of the Mises regression theorem was to, you know, stand as an opposite to the state money of uh, state theory of money, which says government passes a law and then right. gold becomes um, uh, money. So Mises showed how that doesn't need to happen because it happens. It, it can emerge naturally from barter. However, we don't really have a barter system today. So, you know, Bitcoin is not going to emerge out of barter. Uh, or any new form of money is not going to emerge out of barter. It's going to emerge out of a system in which we have um, already we already have um, things that are function as monetary assets. Having said that, I think Bitcoin still does conform to the regression theorem in that, you know, initially these things were digital goods that were collectible that people were collecting and mining Mm -hmm. and people were you know people were paying each other for them or paying expending resources on uh, on obtaining them you know you turn on your computer and run your computer for a couple of hours which no matter how tiny the cost is still a cost in terms of your time and the computer's hardware so people were expending resources on obtaining that thing meaning that it obtained value initially and then later on it started being used as a medium of exchange later on people started using it as as a medium of exchange so i think the regression theorem still applies to uh, to bitcoin you know hayek talked about degrees of moneyness uh, you know can can we look at bitcoin and say look what what is money or whether Bitcoin's money, that's an empirical question that's not for you or me to say that's for the marketplace to say that's not a theoretical uh, economics question. That's a market question. Yes, I think this is an excellent uh, point. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the, the the problem that a lot of economists fall into is that they think, you know, the market needs their permission to function in a certain way. And it's mm-hmm. sad to see some tentatively pro-market Austrian economy, pro-market or pro-Austrian economists make this mistake sometimes, which is that, you know, they'll come up with a theoretical objection for why Bitcoin can't function. And then somehow this, uh, you, know, you know, they expect all these millions of people around the world who are using it to just drop it or stop using it. But, you know, the reality is people in Venezuela are using it. People in the U.S. are using it. People all over the world are using it to play the role of money in many different ways. And, you know, who are who, are, who am I to tell them they should or shouldn't? Yeah. Well, I've noticed some of your tweets lately about Turkey, which is experiencing a currency crisis. It seems like Bitcoin is perhaps 
uh, not early enough uh, to to save Venezuela. But how how could you uh, uh, use Bitcoin today to ameliorate what's happening in Turkey? How how could that work from a technical perspective? I mean, I think the simple answer is just for people to put some of their wealth in it. Like, so if you if you bought ten dollars worth of uh, Bitcoin in Venezuela three years ago you're going to be in a much better financial situation today than if you hadn't you know ten dollars back then would have make a big would have would make a big difference um having said that you know we're uh, we're seeing it spread in venezuela we see bitcoin exchanges spread and we see mm-hmm. an entire black market economy being built around bitcoin and my opinion is that this is going to be similar to the uh, black market economies in the soviet union or the ex-socialist republics where um, you know, they were illegal markets, and yet at some point, you know, the black markets were the only markets that were left because the, the, mm-hmm. the official markets were just uh, supermarkets that had empty shelves and people, who, as, as the old joke goes, you know, people who pretended to work and uh, employees who pretended to pay them. Uh, but at some point, you know, everybody who pretended to work left their job, went home and did actual work for others and traded real things with others. And I think... More and more, this is becoming the case in places like Venezuela, where the only people who are able to um, stay above um, destitution effectively are the people who are being able to use uh, Bitcoin and to spread Bitcoin around. So I think we're going to see more and more of this. However, you know, having said that, I mean, Bitcoin is still very, very uh, nascent. It's still mm-hmm. we haven't built the the, the um the user interface and the infrastructure that would allow people who are not very technically competent to get into this um, easily. But it's it's still early days. Yeah, well, there, there's a lot to worry about. I know you mentioned off camera earlier that you have a little girl and, and you know, living in, in Lebanon, at least in the West, we get the sense that Lebanon is is somewhat in, in the throes of some political upheavals. I mean, what, how does your personal life, how do your personal experiences uh, affect how you see Bitcoin and the need for something outside of government hands to when it comes to storing our, our wealth. I have to say, Lebanon might be uh, possibly a, a bad example for this because I think the Lebanese central bank might just be the best central bank in the world from an Austrian's perspective. Um, I don't say this often in Lebanon because I don't want to be mistaken for uh, a cheerleader for central banking, but you know, Lebanon still has the highest cover of gold behind its currency of any currency in the world and up until the 1970s they had the currency was practically 91 percent i think that was the highest cover of Mm -hmm. gold so they were on the gold standard up until the 1970s and not coincidentally you know lebanon was known as the switzerland of the middle east it was the banking capital of the middle east it was an extremely prosperous uh country and then of course you know during the war they did have one episode of hyperinflation at some point in the 1980s but then after the war since 1990 onwards they um, pegged the currency to the dollar maintained large gold reserves and they've been able to defend the peg for about 23 years now no 27 years 25 something like that they've defended the peg quite successfully at, at one fixed price and i think that's largely due to the fact that they have um, relatively very large gold reserves so um, you know, in, in that regard, in terms of the currency in Lebanon, so far they've been doing okay, although lately things are getting worse and worse because the government is abusing that mm-hmm. stability of the central bank and the banking system. Oh, another thing, the banks in Lebanon have a very high reserve ratio. So okay. the required reserve ratio is 30%, but the actual reserve ratio is about 60-70%. So there's very little fractional reserve banking as well, and the currency is about 50% backed by gold. So that provides some kind of financial stability. But of course, the problem is the government abuses that by just using, you know, taking all the benefits that would, that would accrue from that to society by using them to just finance their government debt. Right. So they have one of the highest rates of government indebtedness in the world. And it allows the government to continue to operate enormously, stunningly in, in inefficient, destructive monopolies on things like electricity and cell phones and uh, you know, garbage collection and so on. And that's that's where the, uh, that's what's really bad about the country. It's just funnily enough, you know, the electricity company just the other day, they uncovered, the, the country still has blackouts at least three hours a day everywhere in the country. And this is a country, you know, back in the 60s, well, somebody turned up a newspaper headline the other day of a first page story in Lebanon talking about how the power was going to be out for 20 minutes today. This was in the 1960s. And now today, 50 years later, you know, it's, it's uh, the, the least that, uh, that you can get is three hours of blackouts per day. 
And then recently they, uh, they, they uncovered that in the electricity company, the national monopoly, obviously, which loses more than $2 billion per year, which wow. for a country of that size is enormous. They, you know, the people who run that company had an entire floor on the company being used as a, um, what they call it, the hatch, place to hatch uh, chicken. Um, so that they have an entire chicken farm in the electricity company because they have free electricity there. So this is the kind of inefficiency that you're talking about. And yeah, it is, you know, Lebanon still has a train station authority that is mm. massively funded, but it doesn't have any trains anymore. It's that kind of inefficiency. So yeah, this sort of uh, perspective, you know, I mean, Governments everywhere will abuse their uh, potential of uh, printing money. And as an individual, you need to look out for yourself. And I think Bitcoin, wherever you are, you know, will protect you from that uh, to an extent. I'm not saying, you know, you should put all your wealth in it, but I think having a little bit of it, if you're in one of these places, is probably a good bet for the long run for your children. Um, you know, not, not as a short term speculative instrument, because, you know, if you're planning right. on buying now and selling it next year, you could lose 80 percent. And I always tell people, you know, don't put into Bitcoin anything that you think you might need in the next 10 years, you know, put in small amounts of money that you don't think you will need so that if it drops 80, 90 percent, you're not in trouble. But if you're willing to wait on it for 10 years, if you have a low time preference and if you're thinking of the long run, if you're thinking of your children, you know, then it's. Uh, it's, it's probably not a bad idea. I mean, personally, I don't plan on selling uh, my Bitcoins anytime soon because, you know, I don't have a lot. I just yeah. buy small quantities. And ideally, I'd love to, uh, you know, I, I'd love to never have to sell any of my Bitcoins and just pass them all along to my children after I die. Uh, that's the sort of time frame that I like to keep on it. <laughs> Well, that's one of the things that I really enjoyed about this book is that you're not a Bitcoin fanboy, and, and that really comes through. This is a, a, a historical and a bit of a technical analysis. Uh, well, one thing you spend a lot of time on, and this, this is very near and dear to most libertarians, is the, the idea of a true peer-to-peer -peer decentralized currency where we're, it's almost like we're giving each, paying each other cash uh, in a parking lot somewhere. There's, there's no intermediary, and that's, of course, one of the great selling points of Bitcoin um, t talk more about that. Talk about how important that is and how with, with government money, with credit cards, with checks, with all, all other forms of payment, you don't have that luxury. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the distinctive thing about Bitcoin, it, it, it's it, Bitcoin. I, I like the term. Uh, it's been misevangelized. People have pe people have made a mistake of evangelizing Bitcoin as being, you know, cheap, free, instant uh, payments all over the world. And that's not exactly the case. It's not entirely the case. Um, Bitcoin is not a payment technology. Bitcoin is a money. It's a hard money. And that's really fundamentally the, the, the point. Bitcoin is a hard money, like gold, but with its built-in settlement network. So imagine if we just mm -hmm. discovered this new chemical element on Earth, which is exactly like gold, um, but you know, fixed in its supply, and also comes with this you know, magical global network that allows you to have about half a million transactions with it anywhere around the world where you can you know, click a button and in one hour it turns up in China. That's really the difference between it. So, um, so far, you know, given that Bitcoin is not very popular yet, it hasn't grown, we're still at a point where um, everybody's able to, uh, everybody who uses Bitcoin is able to use the transactions on Bitcoin. And the transaction fees are relatively low now. They're less than 10 cents or something like that. But, you know, we saw during the end of last year, the transaction fees rose significantly. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think in the long run, we're going to see transaction fees rise more and more and more. They're going to be the only thing that secures the network. And I think there's a hard limit on how many transactions can take place on the Bitcoin network um, per day, because, you know, the way that it functions, the way the Bitcoin is engineered is that there's a limit that is, is that every member needs to have a list of every transaction carried out by every other member. Mm -hmm. And so that is a heavy computation load on any computer. You know, you're before I can send you ten dollars for my lunch at your restaurant. You know, you need to know every single dime spent by anybody anywhere in the world to make sure that my ten dollars right. are still there. Right. And that's really one of the main reasons I wrote the book. I'm trying to explain that Bitcoin is not going to be the replacement for Visa or for MasterCard or for PayPal. I think these payment mechanisms will be or can be built on top of Bitcoin or things similar to them will be built on top of Bitcoin. And my expectation is that we're going to get things that are far more efficient.
But in my opinion, okay, so the element of, you know, peer to peer, individual to individual is very important in Bitcoin. But I don't think, and this is where, you know, I get another way in which I differ with a lot of Bitcoiners is that, you know, this, um, the, this dream that every single person would be able to carry out a, a final settlement transaction with everyone else for every coffee that they buy, I don't think that's workable in the long run. Bitcoin won't scale that way. However, the advantage is not going to be that it's going to give us cheap coffee payments and cheap uh, lunch payments. The advantage is that it's going to allow us to have a far wider, far, far bigger, far more decentralized network of institutions able to perform final settlements with one another. So if you look at the world today, you know, we we have a couple of hundred central banks in the world, but effectively, really, we only have one central bank. And the only way that payments function quickly in the world today is that they are effectively all going through the SWIFT network, which is through the uh, Federal Reserve. So you know, if I pay you with PayPal, with a Visa, with MasterCard, with a bank transfer, effectively, you know, the central bank of the U.S. could stop us from making this payment, no matter where we are in the world. You know, you could be in China and I could be in Kenya and the U.S. central bank could stop that payment. It's all centralized because the nature of the settlement with gold, which I believe is still the monetary standard, and that's why central banks still hold enormous quantities of gold. And as I mentioned in the book, you know, central banks today hold far more gold than they did under the gold standard. Mm. And that's that tells you that gold's role uh, has not been um, removed. But the point is that settlement with gold is very expensive. And so that tends towards the centralization of it, and that tends towards the centralization of political power. I think what Bitcoin allows us is the distribution and the decentralization of the final settlement layer so that instead of having one central bank, we'd have something like maybe 10,000, maybe more institutions that function like central banks, none of which can affect the money supply because none of them can alter the Bitcoin code, but all of whom can perform final settlement of payments. And I think the, you know, the, the, this is what really excites me about Bitcoin. It is just turning central banking from this institution that allows the state unlimited power and unlimited control over its citizens to this utility that's going to be just, you know, like the local, um, well, maybe post office is a bad example because post offices are usually um, government monopolies, but just like a basic utility that is available all over the world that people can opt in and out of, that can people can choose their uh, local bank. And I think that's the, the, that's the really exciting thing, and we're seeing this develop now. And that's that, that's the um, that's the uh, reason behind the title of my book. That we're seeing the way that Bitcoin is scaling. We're already seeing that it's scaling through layered settlement solutions. So more and more of Bitcoin's transactions are not being carried out on chain; mm -hmm. they're being carried out on second layers. So it used to be a couple of years ago, for instance, if you had an account at an exchange, and I had an account at an exchange, and I wanted to send you Bitcoin from my account to your account. The exchanges didn't care. They would actually transmit that uh, transaction onto the Bitcoin blockchain and they'd pay the transaction fee for it. Then as the Bitcoin transaction fees rose, which is expected to happen at some point inevitably, exchanges became much more careful about it. And so they would settle the transaction between you and me on their ledger. And then they would only settle transactions on Bitcoin's ledger when you and I will take money out or send money into the network. So we're seeing that for every transaction on Bitcoin, there are maybe two, three, five, maybe even 10 transactions happening off chain, quite similar to how settlement with the gold standard happened. And that, you know, for every one time that a gold ounce or a gold bar moves between one bank and the other, you have hundreds of transactions of the pieces of paper and the checking accounts that are backed by that gold right. move. Right. But I want to get back to this point you made. This is not how Bitcoin was sold, <laughs> right? We were we, It was sold as every time you spend four bucks at Tim Hortons, you're going to use your Bitcoin and Tim Hortons is going to accept it. And all that's going to have to show up on the ledger. Um, you know, so I think it's, it's an important point you're making that we, this is a way to have a non-governmental settlement process. Yep. And I think that has a, a tremendous value in itself. But in addition to we're probably not going to use uh, a Bitcoin swipe every time we go to Tim Hortons for four bucks, I also want to bring up another sales pitch that was made with respect to Bitcoin. That is banking for the unbanked. You know, imagine the imagine a guy, uh, a merchant in a, in a bad part of Africa in Angola doesn't have access to commercial banks. Commercial banks won't go in there. Doesn't really have access to small business credit. 
uh, doesn't necessarily have the ability to go out and make change, you know, physical cash change for his would-be customers, but nonetheless wants to have a little farm operation, wants to have whatever kind of operation. And people said, well, cryptos are going to come along and they're going to give this guy in Angola the opportunity to do any kind of micro payment or micro lending. And, and, you know, without transaction fees, if Bitcoin transactions fees are high, then it's of no use to the guy in Angola. Yeah, but I mean, I think the, um, you know, it's, uh, the, and that's another example of the misevangelizing for it, because, you know, the idea that the person in Angola is going to start using Bitcoin, I think it's, you know, as Bitcoin as a payment network doesn't make sense unless you already have a number of people who have cash balances in Bitcoin. Right. So, you know, right now, if you and I wanted to buy and sell something, you know, anytime that you and I buy or sell something from somebody, most likely that person doesn't have any Bitcoin. You know, the, the chances of coming across somebody who owns Bitcoin today is less than 1% of the world's population. So the, the likelihood that they want to accept Bitcoin is very low. That's why I never really spend my Bitcoins and I rarely ever get paid in Bitcoin. Well, in my case, it's a little bit different because I, you know, being active in Bitcoin and writing and working in Bitcoin, I come across a lot of Bitcoiners. But see, the, the more people have it, the more people have cash balances in Bitcoin, the more these trades become possible, you know. So it's it's sort of putting the horse before, well, the cart have, before the horse. The cart before the horse, yeah. When you think, you know, okay, look at the people who are who don't have any Bitcoin and let's let them use this thing. Well, you know, if they don't have any Bitcoin yet, it, they, it won't be useful for them. But once people have enough cash yeah. balances, significant amount of cash balances, then they can start using it. But when it comes to transaction fees, you know, I think the misunderstanding is this, the, you know, the, the on-chain Bitcoin transaction ha contains a level of security that is simply overkill for any kind of individual transaction that you and I want to have. Um, well, maybe not any kind, you know, if you're trying to escape Venezuela and you, you know, maybe that is a useful level of security, but for the vast majority of us, you know, it's like putting your daughter's piggy bank in Fort Knox. Okay, mm -hmm. sure, it will ensure security of it, but it's a, it's just your daughter's piggy bank. It's got 20 bucks in it. You know, as long as you have a level of security that makes attacking it worth more, uh, attacking it costs more than 20 bucks, then she's likely going to be all right, right. you know? Right. So we're going to get all these other uh, methods of payment getting built on Bitcoin, but... Uh, a problem is that a lot of people just don't have the patience to wait for these things. They expect Bitcoin to just come out of the box functioning as a global new monetary system. And that's just not going to happen. It's going to take a lot of time for people to learn about it, to learn how to use it, for people to hold it, for the value to go up, for people to understand why it matters. And, you know, Rome was not built in a day and a, a, a Bitcoin standard won't be either. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about privacy and security. Is are Bitcoin transactions traceable? Are they hackable? It's it's a complicated question. The best way I like to answer this is that it's similar to the internet. In that, you know, can you send an anonymous email from the internet? Maybe. Can I track you down? Maybe. It mm -hmm. depends how good you are at hiding your tracks. How good I am at um, uncovering your tracks. But. The reality of it is that, you know, it's a it's, it's not a good starting point. If your concern is privacy, if you're looking for things to do things that are illegal, it's, you know, the, what I described in my book is that, you know, it's Bitcoin is maybe good for victimless crimes. Obviously, I don't believe that there is such a thing as a victimless crime. But, you know, because it's a victimless crime, there's nobody that there's no dead body left behind for people to go sniffing around and trying to figure out how did that crime take place. However, you know, if you're committing a crime where people are likely to come sniffing behind you to try and figure out what you've done, you know, fundamentally, this is a ledger that contains all the transactions that have ever happened. And it's mm -hmm. distributed over thousands and thousands of computers all over the world. So, you know, if you'd like to commit a crime, this is a very bad starting point. You know, it's, it's, it's a bad place to start. And I think, you know, yes, a lot of criminals have used Bitcoin but a lot of criminals are in jail precisely because they use Bitcoin. So, you know, I always say, uh, you know, for any criminals listening, stick to the U.S. dollar, the international yeah. currency of choice. Isn't that interesting? Because all, a lot of the Bitcoin critics say, oh, it's going to be used for black market activity, for drug dealing, for nefarious purposes, for maybe for prostitution or, or human trafficking. And, and as you point out, your human tra trafficking activity is now going to be on the ledger on thousands of computers around the world. 
Yeah, definitely not the right place to do it. I mean, with physical cash, you just pass the physical yeah. cash. And if you wear gloves, it's completely untraceable. There's no way to trace your fingerprints on it. So it's it's arguably preferable. Gold can be melted into other uh, forms as well, which makes it even more uh, um, easy to hide. Bitcoin, I don't think, is ideal in, in, in that sense. And uh, the way that I see it is that, that that's not necessarily a problem because the privacy, I think, that we want from Bitcoin, the ability of people to buy um, things that their government doesn't approve of, I think is going to be easy to build on second layer payment solutions being built on top of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So uh, the way that I see it is that, you know, there'd be a first layer of um, settlement between institutions. And in this situation, you know, uh, these is the, the lack of anonymity is a good thing because it would make those institutions more um, transparent and easy for people to audit because all of their transactions are listed on right. public ledger right. and then they become more identifiable. But then, you know, the way that I see it is in a free market, these institutions will give privacy to the people who want it. And maybe they, you know, there are people who might not want it. So I can imagine a scenario where, you know, People want to have their money in a bank that does not deal with drugs or that does not yeah. deal with alcohol, for instance. Yeah. And, you know, that bank will ban you from using their payments to buy drugs or alcohol. And, you know, you don't like it. You can go to any, one uh, to another bank, which will not care about where you use your right. uh, money. Right. So I think these sort of things are going to be easy to implement on second layer solutions. But on the main chain, I think that the... The, the idea of privacy has been massively oversold to the detriment of many people sitting in jail right now because they believe yeah. this. Well, what would be of greatest interest to, to our fans would be, of course, be tax privacy. But in a certain sense, I don't think Bitcoin solves this because it, a tax authority where you live can present you with a tax form. And, and if you, in fact, sold something using and received payment of Bitcoin, had a capital gain, they can ask you, did you sell anything using cryptocurrencies? And you can lie and say no and perjure yourself on a tax form and you probably get away with it, but but you might not. So we're sort of back in that old analog world in that sense. That's true. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, and where did you get your coins from and who knows how they're going to be traced, you know, to, yeah. to, if they can trace it back. So you bought it from some guy off the street. Well, what if that guy is investigated one day and then you know he goes through the they go through his phone records and they find out that you exchanged emails or messages with him and they could find it so you know i, I <laughs> yeah. would recommend in that sense if, if anybody listening uh no offense to some of the exchanges but if anybody listening thinks some a place like coinbase wouldn't roll over to the irs i suggest you take a look at ubs and some of the swiss banks uh oh, yeah. in, in terms of their offshore holdings they they rolled over quick uh, oh, when, absolutely. when the IRS came, the the ability to track things down is it's it's like an arms race between the person hiding and the person looking. And unless you're extremely, extremely, extremely expert in um, in how Bitcoin and how its blockchain works and in hiding your tracks, you should probably not take your chances on thinking, yeah, they're not going to find out about this. Mm -hmm. It's uh, I, I highly don't recommend that, that people think that, you know, oh, well, you know, I bought it from Coinbase, but it was five years ago and there's no way anybody will find out about it. I I, I really don't recommend that. If you don't, you know, some or some people are experts and at this, they can hide their tracks or so on. But, you know, if you're if you're listening to me to learn about Bitcoin, then you probably not are not one of those people. I am not one of those people. And, uh, you know. Uh, I would not recommend it. I wouldn't want people to uh, get into trouble because they heard me. So I, I, I like to be very clear about this. Well, let's talk about that, though. In the past few years, there is emerged, another term we're using today, uh, a lot of scammers. There, there's kind of a phony crypto industry. And of course, when the price of Bitcoin was very, very high, there were a lot of uh, people who had these uh, instant new careers and they were experts and they were telling us X, Y, and Z. And, and uh, you know, Warren Buffett says when the tide goes out, we, we'll see who's wearing shorts. Uh, but that's kind of happened with Bitcoin. It seems like there's less hype. Yes, definitely. And this isn't the first time we see this. We, uh, you know, Bitcoin's, it's, uh, it's, uh, the supply is perfectly predictable, but the demand is always varying. And so it's natural that bubbles will form and bubbles will crash. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's just a typical thing to expect in an easy money economy, because at this point, Bitcoin is an asset in a monetary economy denominated in easy money whose supply shrinks and increases over time. Mm 
a lot a lot of people have capitalized on it but i think it's just an inevitable part of market um, of 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 um, market teaching people what's right and what's wrong and people figuring out this is how reputations are built and destroyed and um, people will figure out what's right and what's wrong over time i think so safe one thing i really liked about the book is you mention the Belle Epoque period from the 1870s to about World War One, where a lot of great advancements were made under a gold standard. Uh, it's it's some it's sort of interesting that li- it's now libertarians are never supposed to say anything good about the 1800s. It's become this period where you know the the past is always bad. We all have to be progressives now. So I thought it was really neat that you brought up how productive and flourishing economically that period was. Absolutely. And I think it's, you know, both economically and culturally, you see this aspect of it. Um, you know, in, t- in terms of innovation, there's a study that, uh, that there was a book that was uh, written a few years ago about the most important innovations in human history. And it contains about 6,000 innovations, more than 6,000. And so one uh, one scholar then took these and um, plotted them by time and then measured them against per capita. And you find that the most innovative period in human history was that period towards the end of the 19th century. Uh, that's a quantitative way of analyzing it. But a qualitative way of analyzing it is, you know, I list the things that were invented back then. You know, everything that we tend to think of as the 20th century gave us this technology was more or less invented in that period. It's astonishing. You know, the airplane, the car, the elevator, um, sanitation, hot and cold running water, all of the things that make modern life possible were largely invented in that period. And in the 20th century, they were popularized, they were made cheaper, they spread out all over the world. But I think that there's a strong case to be made that that was the time where people had the lowest time preference, where people were thinking of the future much more, people were investing much more, and capital accumulation was happening, allowing more and more innovation, and more and more in, uh, invention to happen. And I think you also see it in terms of arts and culture. And I think th- there's a great book by uh, Jack Barzun called From Dawn to Decadence. It's astonishing. You know, the book is, is, is a massive volume of, I think, a thousand or eight hundred pages or something like that. And he talks about Western civilization and he says basically the beginning of the decadence of Western civilization, he times it toward to 1914. And you know, he describes it politically, economically, socially, but also in terms of art and culture. And it's astonishing that you know that date, 1914, it's no coincidence that that was the beginning of World War One. It's also no coincidence that I mentioned that was the beginning of the move away from gold towards government money. I think the two are extremely related because once you move towards government money, and that's really one of the key concepts in my book, once the money is losing its value, you know, you move from people who are future oriented towards people who are more present oriented. And so you see art today is, you know, it takes an artist 15 minutes to draw the painting, whereas, you know, in the past, it would take them years and years of hard work to, to be able to complete the masterpiece. And I think that's really no coincidence. It's um, we, we like to pretend that everything is better today. But we have to differentiate between things being better because of a result of the technologies that were invented yesterday. So, of course, you know, today's cars are better than the cars of 100 years ago, but we're not inventing the new car, you know. And, and, and it, I, if I wanted to be a little bit controversial about this, this is going to really offend um, tech people. But really, even the telecommunication uh, revolution, which we think of as a 20th century thing, you know, <laughs> You could say the internet is just the telegraph with bells and whistles on it. I mean, it was in the 19th century that the telegraph and the telephone and even the computer, that's when they were invented. That's where these inventions came along. And so in the 20th century, we improved on them. But I think if we looked objectively, of course, the standard of living today is higher, but it's higher because we're 100 years. We've had these things for 100 years, but we're not inventing as many of these things as we had back then. You know, it's interesting if the, the same globalists, self-proclaimed globalists, I don't think they're real globalists. I think they're political globalists. But globalists yeah. hate Bitcoin and they hate yeah. the 1800s with a passion as well. It's interesting that here's something that's, that's they don't like a, glo- a potentially global institution, a global cryptocurrency that, that they don't control. So they're globalists only when it comes to things under their control. That's an excellent point. I hadn't thought about it. You would think that the sort of globalist progressive people who are always going on about, you know, one world and one world government and so on, they'd love it. But no, you're absolutely correct because it, it exposes their agenda. It's not really about having the world uh, being open on one another. It's really about having the entire world being controlled by people with their agenda who think the same thing that they think. That's, I hadn't thought of it that way. 
It's a great point. Well, you know, we're about out of time, but you know, it's great that that uh, Nassim Taleb is is associated with you. It's great that your book is on a large publisher. Um, and he has this this incredible quote on the jacket. He says, "Look, even if cryptos like Bitcoin fail, now we have the tech. We know we can do it." Uh, I just wonder if just knowing we can do it, if that alone will act as as sort of a, a de facto check on central banks. In other words, that crypto is even out there. Does that does that force them to maybe be a little less expansionary? Yeah, you know, the other day I was giving a talk in Toronto and uh, uh, it, it occurred to me that, you know, even if Bitcoin doesn't succeed, you know, all that we need is maybe, you know, if, if it uh, Venezuela, if it sets an example for Venezuela that more and more Venezuelans start moving, let's say, towards Bitcoin, then it forces uh, it, it forces a uh, bankruptcy of the current socialist kleptocracy in Venezuela. And then a new government that comes along in Venezuela will know that, you know, if we mess around, people can just defect from here to Bitcoin. Maybe Bitcoin doesn't end up being adopted all over the world. Maybe it doesn't end up being a new monetary standard, but it acts as a sort of the metaphor I gave is a sort of monetary Batman lurking in the shadows of Mm -hmm. every society Mm -hmm. so that, you know, anytime a government begins to inflate, people can just start moving towards it. And as they start moving towards it, you know, because the supply is limited, the value rises. So it's a very attractive notion for people to start jumping onto it. So maybe it's just going to be this, you know, this bad guy that is going to uh, that is going to force discipline on governments. And there's another scenario, which is, I think, the most likely scenario if you wanted to kill Bitcoin, the most uh, the, the most effective way to do it, you know, all of the scenarios that people give is governments will ban it or they will mm-hmm. shut it down or they will mm-hmm. close the Internet. And I think these are highly unlikely because uh, they don't address the economic incentives. And as you know, economic incentives are very powerful. So, you know, you can in, in Russia, they tried all sorts of things. They, you know, they, they tried to ban jeans in the Soviet Union. And now, look, the Soviet Union is gone <laughs> and everybody's wearing jeans there. So, you know, economic incentives are more powerful. And I think these ideas for banning Bitcoin won't work. But one way that you could maybe at least make a serious dent in Bitcoin's growth would be to restore the gold standard. You know, if everywhere in the world had sound money and you had a free market in banking and people had the ability to have bank accounts that respect their privacy and respect their monetary sovereignty, I think that would seriously undercut demand for Bitcoin. And I would personally be very happy if Bitcoin's entire, you know, if it turns out to be just a head fake that gets us back on the gold standard, it would have more than done its job as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of Bitcoin books out there. There's a lot of crypto uh, videos you can watch. You don't need any of them. You need this book, The Bitcoin Standard, by our guest, Saifedean Amos. Follow him on Twitter. That's the easiest way to keep up with him. It's just at Saifedean, S-A-I-F-E-D-E-A-N. And I'm really enjoying some of his political commentary. He's got some great tweets lately about what's happening in Turkey, uh, which is starting to get alarming. So that said, Safe, thank you so much for your time. It was a great conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.